Howdy, this is Jim Rutt, and this is The Jim Rutt Show. Listeners have asked us to provide pointers to some of the resources we talk about on the show. We now have links to books and articles referenced in recent podcasts that are available on our website. We also offer full transcripts. Go to jimruttshow.com. That's jimruttshow.com. Today's guest is Nora Bateson, president of the International Bateson Institute. Hi, Tim. Great to be here. Hey, Nora. Great to have you here. Nora is an award-winning filmmaker, writer, and educator. Her work asks the question, how we can improve our perception of the complexity we live within so we may improve our interaction with the world. Nora wrote, directed, and produced the award-winning documentary, An Ecology of Mind, a portrait of her father, Gregory Bateson. Her work brings the fields of biology, cognition, art, anthropology, psychology, and information technology together into a study of the patterns in ecology of living systems. Her book, Small Arcs of Larger Circles, is a revolutionary personal approach to the study of systems and complexity. As usual on The Jim Rutt Show, I've read Nora's book and I've watched her film, and we'll get to those. But first, I'm going to ask you a couple of introductory questions to provide some framing. Maybe first we could start off with, what is the International Bateson Institute? You know, a little history, what are your projects? So the International Bateson Institute is actually a WHO, and it's a grouping of people who have been working together over the past five or six years on a couple of different research projects. And uh, the idea is basically to keep some of the... um, the work going that was started by my father, Gregory Bateson, and before him, his father, William Bateson. And then also, I guess my sister's in on that, Mary Catherine Bateson. Um, she's not actively involved with the Institute, not because of anything, just because everybody's busy. And what we are doing is looking at how we can use some of the ideas that my father and his father and others have been generating toward looking at research in another way and trying to kind of go further. How do we take this further? So at the heart of it, there's this idea of transcontextual research. So this word transcontextual comes from Gregory's book, Steps to an Ecology of Mind. And it's a word that jumped off the page at me. And it was just so helpful because it was this moment where I I realized that so much of my own work with complexity and context was getting kind of stuck in the boundaries of where's the edge of the context. And when I started thinking about things as happening in multiple contexts simultaneously and in response to each other, it opened up the possibilities for all kinds of projects. So right now we're working on the beginnings of a project on how little tiny children, ages three and four, um, both perceive and actually can do abstract, complex thinking, which has been fascinating. And we did a project on addiction and the transcontextual process of addiction, one on learning, how systems learn, Um, but projects like that. Sounds great. And listeners, we'll have a link on our uh, website, as usual, to the uh, Institute so you can learn more. Nora mentioned her father and her grandfather. For those of you who don't know who they are, uh, hers is a family of great intellectual distinction. Gregory Bateson was one of the great 20th century polymaths. His home base was in anthropology, but he was active in many other fields, including being one of the founders of systems thinking and cybernetics. Her grandfather, William Bateson, was the biologist who was the first person to actually use the term genetics to describe the study of heredity. Pretty amazing, huh? Uh, And he uh, was considered one of the chief popularizers of the ideas of Gregor Mendel following their rediscovery around 1900. Very interesting to come from such a family. My own family is quite the opposite. My father dropped out of high school after ninth grade, and my mother grew up on a beet tenant farm in the swamps of northern Minnesota, in a house with no electricity, no running water, or no central heat. She left home at the age of 14. So those are pretty much the two extremes. You know, you know I was thinking about that. I said, kind of like depth versus freedom. 
you know, you got a lot of stuff for free. Like, for instance, science as a cool tool to learn about the world. But on the other hand, there were some biases in the directions that you went. You know, I had to learn a lot more on my own. But on the other hand, I was free to study and choose on what to be. Your thoughts on what the great intellectual distinction of your family has given you as a, as a tool and a legacy for your life? Oh, Jim, that's such a big question. We could spend the whole hour right there. But I want to just go back to where you started, because it could be that even though our pasts, our, our ancestry appears different, it could be that they're not as different as you think. Because there are the trappings of the academic world and the sort of the hubbub and the culture of, you know, British Cambridge culture. But actually, the reality is that William and Gregory were both rejected by that culture because they were fighting from from the outside. They were pushing the system in ways it didn't want to be pushed. So I would bet that some of the onboard experiential wisdom of your household was probably more in keeping with what my family was up to than <laughs> than a lot of what was going on at Cambridge. And I know that sounds a little bit radical, but but the fact is that they were fighters and they were trying to get um, from the turn of the century, uh, William was really working toward trying to understand heredity as a contextual environmental process, not just something that was linear inside the organism and passed down across generations, but something that was, was visible in the relationships and the responsiveness in those relationships in an actual environment. And this was happening at the same time that eugenics was the darling of science. And in the beginning, I think William, like a lot of other scientists, I mean, remembering that eugenics started well before the turn of the century, you know, it was, it was going to be an altruistic thing. You know, eugenics was going to be how we could make better societies, like Plato's Republic or something. You know, what does it take? And then... It turned out, of course, that the more William was working with it, the more he realized this was an enormous violation and a vulgarity. And he turned on his colleagues who were in the eugenics realm and said, this is a violence against nature and you need to treasure your exceptions. That's a, that's a William Bateson meme there. Treasure your exceptions. And that it was in the mutations that you could see how things were responding to their contextual environmental processes. So the reason this is important is that it, it was also a socio-political act. Okay, so it seems like we're talking about genetics and science. But remember that what was happening in the academy was then getting put into the political and the journalistic and the economic realms. And so William had nothing but suspicion for the establishment to the extent that he walked away from Cambridge when they offered him the first chair in genetics and went to start his own lab. And to the extent that when the king offered him knighthood, he refused. <laughs> wow, pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty hardcore. And he was also one of the people who fought most adamantly for women to be both students and professors in the Cambridge University. So, and then my dad came along and he too, uh, you know, this is something that a lot of people who are playing with the ideas of systems and complexity know this body of work as a a really beautiful intellectual romp of formulas and theories and all kinds of wonderful material that's been generated since cybernetics and maybe before. But when Gregory was in New Guinea in 1929, when he met Margaret, the two of them, they were young. He was 25 years old and she might have been 26. And they were young and they were horrified because at that moment, what was happening, right? At that moment, fascism was on the rise. And so they started writing letters to their friends and this incredible grouping of people who would later become 
some of the participants of the Macy conferences. And they were fighting for what they called a new kind of science. And it would be a science that would study how the world is put together instead of compartmentalizing, fragmenting, and taking the world apart. And they didn't know what this was. And there's all these great letters. They're in the Library of Congress, if you ever want to go find them. And they're lovely. They're these just earnest young people who want to save the world. And they don't know what they're playing with because it doesn't exist yet. So they're throwing these words out, um, trying to figure out what they're talking about. But under it is this beautiful passion. And the passion is about how to prevent the trauma and secondary trauma and the brokenness of sociocultural post-fascism world. And that's what they were concerned about. So they thought that if you could objectify anything, it could be exploited. And so they were trying to think about ways to study the world without objectification. So I, you know, I, I find a lot of inspiration in that. It sounds like they were uh, thinkers ahead of their time. Yeah. Another question before we hop into your book. In both the book and the movie and some of the talks that you gave, which I've looked at also, you use a beautiful analogy of windows from which we look at the world mm -hmm. so that our subjective experience is essentially a window onto the world, I think is the way you kind of probably vulgarizing it a little bit because you have such beautiful words. I'm less a beautiful words kind of guy. But then that you never quite answer a question that I always like to start with is what is your view of reality? Do you believe there is a single unitary view and that we each have our own subjective experience of that? Or do you believe that the subjectivity is somehow tangled up in the nature of reality itself, if that makes any sense? Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I mean, one of the issues with subjectivity is that it implies objectivity and it implies separateness. This is always a tricky one because I think the best way to think about this question is really having something to do with the matrix, that there's a lot of paradoxes in this. So I might like to think I have my own perspective, my own window on the world. But when I actually look at what's in that window, it all came from my context and my contexts and the, the experiences of my life. It's, it's a paradox, really. So are those ideas my ideas? Is that perception my perception? Or is it a sort of unique concoction of contextual process? And so, you know, on the one hand, yeah, I can definitely say, Jim, I am Nora, and I am so Nora. I can't do anything but Nora. That's what I do, right? And you go around and you just Jim. That's what you do. And we can't do anything else. But at the same time, where's the edge of Nora? Where's the edge of Jim? Where do you begin? And where is it that your language or your even your microbiome, your culture, your education, your family, your ideas, your broken hearted memories, your like where where are those boundaries? I don't know. It seems very fluid to me. Yeah, we'll talk about that quite specifically as we get into the book. But I, the nature of reality itself, are you a person who believes in a naive realism that there is an actual physical world out there that we're interacting with, despite the fact that it is complicated because our subjectivity is actually part of that world. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I didn't answer that question. Um, do I believe there's a reality out there? Um, yeah, I think I do. I think that, you know, I think the, the tree is, is a tree. I mean, I think, I think there's a tree there, but what I'm perceiving as tree, now that's another question. Indeed, absolutely. And I think we're probably four square on both sides of that is uh, because there are a lot of people these days who at least question whether objective reality actually exists outside of ourselves. And then, of course, there's an error, at least I would call it an error on the other side, which tries to minimize uh, the impact of subjectivity. And it seems to me that something close to a right way of thinking about the world is both, as is so often the case, right? Yeah. There is an objective reality out there, which we can never know in its fullness, right? And we have a subjectivity 
which is, a, I love your model, is, which is a window onto that world. And oh, by the way, that window is part of the world, right? <laughs> and uh, as you say, they're somewhat tangled up and almost uh, paradoxical, but hey, that's just the way it is. We've got to work our way through it. Yeah, I, I think that the paradox is really valuable. Yeah, exactly. Don't be afraid of it. Do not be afraid of what seems like a paradox. No, I, I, because it's if you play with that paradox, if you live with that paradox, it allows you to kind of zoom in and zoom out simultaneously. And I think that's probably the most productive kind of thinking that I've ever experienced because it allows for a kind of strictness and a rigor but also for there to be fluidity and blurredness and a humility of curiosity and care. So I, that, I think it's important to have both. In fact, one of the things I loved about the book was how you kept that tension between the liminal, but also rigor, mm -hmm. right? It's interesting. Some people go too far in one direction or the other. You have, you have this beautiful tension between the two. So with that, let's hop in and talk about your book. And the title of the book is Small Arcs of Larger Circles, available on Amazon. And we'll have a link to it on the uh, episode page as usual. One of the first things I reacted strongly to in the book was, but the mountainsides of Big Sur, California, the scent of sage in the warm sun, the salty fog of the Pacific Ocean, and the ancient redwoods are the Bible upon which I swear my truth. Aha. I love that. <laughs> Big Sur has always been this magnet for me. Uh, I first discovered it on a my first hitch, cross-country hitchhiking trip. I actually hitchhiked down Highway 1 and slept on some hippie's couch for a couple days at Big Sur and uh, went all the way down to LA. And I always get drawn back. If I'm close to Big Sur, I have to go there because there's something about that setting that just is like in the world. I know no greater place in some sense to ring my bell. And so I was very taken with that as an early quote from your book. You've actually spent a fair amount of time there, haven't you? I have. I, I mean, when I think of this sort of impossible question of what is home, for me, that is home. And I was there quite a bit as a child. We had a, a house actually up on Gorda Mountain. And then when my father got sick, we moved to Esalen. And those were the days, I tell you. It was a very different era um, of the early 70s up to about 1984. I was there at least half the year of every year. So That explains a fair amount about who you are. <laughs> if you've spent that much time at a place that is so powerful in every way as Big Sur, that, ex that explains it. Another interesting quote right away, which is a little bit oracular, like some uh, fair bits of the book are, is to be a participant in a complex system is to desire to be both lost and found in the interrelationships between people, nature, and ideas. Could you unpack that a little bit for mm -hmm. us? Yeah. I think that I am very curious about Oh, what it means to be alive, what, what it means to be part of a, a, a culture, but also, you know, living in the complex system that is my own body in relationship with other people's bodies and the ecology and just all of these beautiful complex systems and terrible complex systems in relationship to each other, always shifting, responding, moving. And, you know, you can't ever be completely sure of what it is. But you're also not ever completely unsure. There's this business of being a participant in life is it's on board. It's in us, right? So we, we are both utterly confused by it, but it is the way that we know. So it's both of those things. And the notion of the complex systems that we're within spans not just ecology and cognition, but also culture and social interaction, and I would say also interaction with technologies, and that somehow those things aren't even separable. So where are we in that, Jim? Who are we in that? And yeah. Is there really a boundary between the game and the player, yeah. right? It's like what, one of the things I like to say about complexity and how it differs from reductionism is that reductionism is the study of the dancer, while complexity is the study of the dance. And you can't have the dance without the dancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. 
Yeah, I, thought, I, I kind of come to like that little line myself. You know, something that, you know, next step in, in, in your thinking that came out is you talked about something called mental monocropping. <laughs> uh, I, like, I love that. I'm gonna, I may well steal that with attribution, of course. You know, the idea of generating ideas in singular fields that are bred to be resistant to cross-pollination. Goddamn right. It is interesting how memetically they build these walls in academia. Uh, education, media, and social structures present overlapping patterns of compartmentalization. Why just one concept of birth, marriage, death, friendship, work, economy, right or wrong, right? That's, uh, I love that. Such a str- such strong language. You know, I've been associated with the Santa Fe Institute now for the last 18 years. And, you know, we work really hard to work past those boundaries. But man, when you get out to other parts of especially academia, those walls are huge, right? But and yet we we both know they're entirely artificial. Yeah, uh, and you know people base their entire lives on them, and you know increasingly uh, the idea of a profession within or outside of academia is partitioned into ever smaller bits of monocropped information. Yep, and this is really dangerous. It's quite literally fucking with the soil of ideas. And who we can be as human beings, where we can show up. Yeah, deep. And it's, it's one of the reasons I was drawn when I retired from business in 2001, why I was drawn to complexity science, because it's, you know, radically uh, oriented towards working across all these levels as if they didn't even exist. Hmm. But we have to fight so much against the institutional obstructions, for instance, uh, government funding from the National Science Foundation. We do quite well at winning those uh, competitive grants, but the process is just unbelievably hard because if a project spans multiple so-called disciplines, it has to be approved by you know, basically reviewers in all the disciplines rather than having a group of reviewers who are who are able to look across disciplines. And that just makes the whole process literally three times harder. And so much of our intellectual world, I guess it came from the German university system, is all generated around the old joke about a PhD, which is knowing more and more about less and less until you know absolutely every, everything about absolutely nothing, right? <laughs> Well, exactly. And the problem is that then when it's peer reviewed by people who are inside those various disciplines, the, of course, it just gets re siloed. And the information that is actually in the space in between is readable to none of those silos because it isn't there. I mean, what actually is going to come out of those moire phenomenon, you know, of, of one sort of thing co- coming into contact with another and a, a new thing happens. And who's going to check that? Which department does that happen in? The liminal department? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to look. I'm going to look up uh, the catalog of Harvard and see if they have a liminal department. Yeah, well, I'm willing to bet. I bet you a lunch they don't. <laughs> <laughs> and when they do, let's just give up, okay, Jim? Yeah, exactly. It'll be done. Put a, put a fork in it. <laughs> At the Santa Fe Institute, we're constantly convening workshops, I don't know, 15 or 20 a year that go across disciplines. And typically they're three-day meetings that recur, you know, over a period of years where groups of people from different disciplines attempt to, you know, work on a problem across lines. And one of the ones I'm familiar with is the ongoing work we have done on the on state formation, looking at everything from biology to linguistics to anthropology to economics. And one of the truisms of the people who do this for a living, I guess you get to be a spectator most of the time. Sometimes I participate. And in fact, I've even held some workshops. But the usual rule of thumb is you can figure the first two and a half days is just getting the people from the different disciplines to agree on a common vocabulary. Right. Exactly. And, but it's, it's very important to do that up front. And, and of course, people always slip back into their own vocabulary. But that you know, that seems to be job one of working on something truly, uh, what's your word for it? You have a better word than any I've seen before. Transcontextual. Transcontextual. That's better than transdisciplinary. I think so too. I'm so happy with transcontextual. I am too. I just discovered it, you know, five days ago when I was reading your book. And so I'm going to st- try to propagate that meme, see what happens. Yeah. You know, first step of transcontextual is to try to develop at least a subset language that allows people coming from very different places to talk to each other meaningfully. Exactly. And that is a really interesting project because one of the things that they have to do is they have to actually speak not only 
in their professional speak, but they have to actually speak in other textures and tones of communication as well to get to those other contexts. So that's a really interesting thing that I've been playing with. And you might have felt that in my book, that there's a tone mixture going on because the, these different tones pull each other into different windows of meaning, right? They're like musical notes mean something different next to other rhythms, right? Yeah, one of the cool things I'll just point out for the audience, the reason you should go buy this book is there's a number of prose essays and examinations, but between them are some generally fairly short, but rather beautiful bits of poetry. And I, I felt that if you're going to deal with the transcontextual complexity of life, then we have to be able to explore from our own different con contexts of sense making what that is. So if I want to think about the complexity of climate science, I need to actually figure out and have some sense of how that meets my emotional responsibility or, or, or experience of being a parent, of being a spouse, of presenting myself to a group of people. Yeah, what it is to have a life, right? That seems to be missing from things like climate discussions all too often, where it's a discussion of numbers and such. And while that's important, you know, this is going to become a dominant phenomena about what it is to have a life. And if we don't think about it in that context, we're missing a huge part of the story. Yeah, that's it right there, Jim. That's exactly that's exactly it. That's the issue. I think the biggest issue we're facing right now. Yeah, I made a note to myself that, you know, anthropology is certainly a huge help in, in somewhat getting over some of these ideas about a single, like, for instance, the words you used, a single concept of birth, marriage, death, friendship, work, economy. You know, if we, anyone who's read any anthropology at all knows there's an amazing variety of ways that humans have found the ability to live together, right? And that's why it's so important for people to read some anthropology. So they're not so tunnel visions and thinking that, Oh yeah, we got to have this exactly this kind of marriage or this kind of nature of work. Humans have solved those problems thousands of different ways over the years, and that whole toolkit's available for us going forward. Should we should we have the nerve to look at it? I think it's probably one of the most important things we can do right now. It's kind of ironic too because there's such a sort of seemingly rabid allergy to having cross cultural interaction right now, and. Yet, without it, there's no way to find the blind spots. It's in those relationships where you find that you don't understand something the same way someone else does, that you start to discover entirely new possibilities of, of ways of seeing and living. And I think if we're going to find any sort of new sense-making, new ways of living, that we're going to need that. If nothing else to stir the pot, not necessarily to adopt other people's ideas, but to recognize that our own, like you said, tunnel vision. And these things, they sneak right up on you and you just don't see them coming. I have this, this story that I often tell about my, one of my Swedish stepkids who was making a sandwich for breakfast and they eat sandwiches for breakfast here. And in Sweden, you cut cheese with this cheese thing that you pull across the top of the cheese, the cheese sort of planer. And I think in my life and experience living in the US and Canada, everybody owned one of those things, but nobody ever actually used it. Because if you pull the cheese slicer across the top of the whole cheese, then you've taken somebody's, a little bit of somebody's cheese who was going to slice it, you know, up and down. And uh, so he was trying to cut the cheese, and I, I said he couldn't find the cheese cutter. And he said, I can't find it. And I said, oh, just use a knife. It's probably in the dishwasher. And he bumped and he thumped, and five minutes went by. And then he said, it's not working. <laughs> and I went in, and he was trying to push the knife across the top of the cheese head first, like it was the cheese planer. And, you know, it never occurred to me that he was going to do that. And it never occurred to him to do it any other way. And we both sort of looked at each other and thought, wow, that never occurred to either one of us. And the reason I'm bothering to tell this story is that there's something really important there. 
which is the opening of a possibility of recognizing what you never considered. And there's just so much potential for new kinds of perception in exactly that space. And of course, you know, what is a society or a culture except a conglomeration of other cultures and societies, right? I mean, of course. I went to this party here that was a, a midsummer, which is a big deal in Sweden, a midsummer party. And they had this little quiz about all the things that are Swedish midsummer cultural things, the food, the dress, the songs, the rituals, all this stuff, none of them were from Sweden. And and so this business of whether you study anthropology or just hang out with people and pay attention to the way they think in different ways than you do, um, it seems to me the only way out of the matrix. Yeah, certainly a very, a very good way out of the matrix, for sure. In fact, interestingly, a uh, guy I know, Joshua Bach, a guy who works in AI, but he's also a good general thinker about things. He posted something on Twitter recently, which caught my attention. And he said, you know, an ideal society be- would be one that was radically open to knowing all about other societies and picking and choosing those components that work best and adopting them ruthlessly in their own society. And yeah, and my response was, yeah, that is, that sounds perfect to me. Unfortunately, human chauvinism and xenophobia seem to make that hard for an awful lot of people to do. Yeah, that's for sure. And But what I think is actually, I would push it one step further, which is to say that What I learned from that was not really about how Swedes think about cutting cheese, but how my own frame of reference and perception was limited. And that was the important piece of information. It wasn't really about the practices. It was about thinking in a different way, which, I mean, where did the consequences of that little experience bubble up? maybe, you know, on the bus three days later when someone stepped in front of me, I didn't think, "Mm, I can't believe this person stepped in front of me. Maybe I thought about that in another way. You know, so it's it's not a linear process of what happens when you start to recognize those. It's not harvesting new concepts. It's actually, it's inhabiting a world in which there are concepts everywhere that you might be able to see differently. Or harvest, even, or harvest, right? I mean, a, you yeah. know, as I said, as a musician say, you know, amateurs borrow professional steel. <laughs> and as we try to, you know, build our society to adapt to the crazy rate of change we have, I suspect that one of the best ways to find good piece parts, though, of course, you have to modify them for our local conditions, is to look what other people have done, right? For instance, I am looking fairly carefully at Sweden, amongst other things, for two things. One is their methods of the genders working together in ways that are kind of probably surprising to a lot of Americans. It's probably the most gender unstereotyped society on earth today. And yet you look at, you know, the number of men in engineering, number of women in nursing, they're actually higher than they are in the U.S. So once you get past gender stereotyping, you can let gender reality have its way and not be upset by it. The Swedes have also done some very interesting and subtle things around how they have labor unions. You may well know that like 90% of Swedes belong to labor unions, Mm -hmm. but they're much more cooperative and much less antagonistic than American and much less corrupt than American style labor unions. So those two piece parts from Sweden seem to be ones that at least seem to me to be good to think about incorporating into, into other societies. Yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting thing. I mean, when I first came here, I really, I, you know, I, I had this idea that this was a sort of, you know, as good as it gets for Western civilization, you know, kind of socio-political systems. And I think I've rethunk that now. Oh, interesting. I'd love to hear about that. Well, one of the things that's been so interesting to me has been to see how this, because, you know, there's, there's quite a, a strong social welfare system here. And I, of course, I grew up as an American kid. And I mean, let's just face it, in the States, you kind of grow up with the idea that basically the government's there to screw you over. It's not some place you go to get help or to... <laughs> It's, it's not a benevolent thing, really. It's there to, you know, you pay taxes, they buy bombs. It's, you know, 
So I didn't have a lot of warm, fuzzy feelings about the idea of a state as a kind of parental body. And it was difficult for me to understand this kind of blind, what felt very naive trust in this external system. But also I thought, well, maybe that's just me because, you know, our, our government doesn't really help you. It lets people fall through the cracks and leaves them on the streets. So we see it all the time. But maybe this is in a different kind of place. And what I started to see increasingly was that an interesting phenomenon emerges where I might have to back up a tad here. So prior to the big welfare system coming in, there was sort of the, the oppression of both the family and the church. And so the public state welfare system allowed people to be free of the sort of the tyranny of the family. So you could have another job besides the one your father had, right? And you could marry in a different way, enjoy your sexuality in a different way, that sort of thing have a different religion, and the church as well. So there were these two institutions that were holding people back. The state freed them. But when that happened, it what is so ironic, but this notion of, a, of an overarching well-being at a social level that's supported by the state actually produces a kind of individualism that I never would have expected. So people don't turn to each other for help. They turn to the state. And the deep cultural consequences of that are really disconcerting. You know, I had a good friend who was dying of cancer, and the state was offering to give him care for 11 minutes a day. And so I turned to all his friends and family and said, Okay, so this is what we do. We just get together and we take on meals and laundry and we, you know, we bathing and we take care of him. And they looked at me like I had fallen out of the sky. And I couldn't understand what I had said. This is another one of those cheese cutter moments, right? Where I was like, what did I say? That was so wrong. <laughs> but I had suggested that we behave in what I would have just le leaned into as the fabric of community. And it wasn't there. Yeah, that's unfortunate. I mean, this is a trend that's been noted by some thinkers is that, and it varies a little bit between the right and the left, is that what traditionally was done by family and community is now done either by the state or the marketplace. Right. And, you know, on the more right wing places, it happens in the economy and left wing places, more state, but it's a balance between the two. But both leave out the organic family and community. And it's just why I've kind of gotten disgusted by both left and right. I think that whatever comes next, whatever replaces what we have today, really ought to be completely orthogonal to either our current vision of left and right, because they they have missed the organic. They have missed, you know, the live part of what it is to be human and have abstracted these functions to the state. A perfect example that you gave that, you know, why should, you know, late life care be an 11 minute increments provided by a bureaucratic entity rather than being an organic whole offered by the family and the community? Or on the, on the U.S. case, oh yeah, okay, you pay somebody to do this, right? Neither of those is what humans really want. You know, they want conviviality, they want the organic. You know, another example that reinforces that is the, the you know the United States, for all of its somewhat right wingery, and at least on global basis, is by far the most philanthropic country on earth. Mm. When I talk to Europeans, they're always amazed at how many Americans give money to charity. I mean, and not just rich Americans, an amazing percentage of Americans give a meaningful percentage of their income to charity. While the European, more or less to your point, says, well, isn't that the state's job? Right. You know, maybe we have so much philanthropy because our state is less broad. But on the other hand, it provides a much richer ecosystem where individual decisions of funding decide what kinds of philanthropy exist rather than a one size fit all bureaucratic approach. So, and all of these are examples of ways in which there has been a, a structure. And then the culture has been in response to these various policy structures. And this is, I think, an important place to, to speak into, Jim, because, you know, I'm with you. Both the left and the right are. are wildly 
out of sync with what actually needs to be discussed. There's so much to talk about right now, and there's so little of any of it happening in the political debates from either side. No one's talking about the things we actually need to talk about, and yet they're glaring. So it, it's an issue. And, and I think this bit that we've been sort of skating along around our whole conversation here of, of where it is that this mushy, systemic sense-making process is fixing across multiple contexts and between them, and, and how it is that we go about thinking about who we are in the world we're in together. Because I don't do that by myself. I do that with you, right? I do that in my community, with my family, with my kids, with my partner. Who am I if I'm not in, in reflection and response, right? So, I, you know, I, I think for me, this is a really, it's a, it's a really important topic because so often when we do get to that blessed moment where we get to talk about complexity and in terms of these things we're dealing with, whether it's economic inequality or climate change or um, exploitation or any of those things, it gets flattened again into a, a, a sort of a, a map of separated, time-constrained processes that are sort of in an illustration like an engineering design. And the real sort of the, the juice of it falls out. And then we have these responses, which of course are human responses. They are our nonverbal cheese cutter type confusions. And I think that so much of what we're faced with right now is confusions that are compounded with other confusions that are, you know, knee deep in centuries of brokenness. You're, you're familiar with the uh, game B concept, aren't you? At least a little bit. I am. Yeah. I, and I'm amused by it. And I'm trying to figure out what it is, which I think is the game B is that we're trying to figure out what it is. Right. That's the thing. It's, it's a yeah, I resonate with that because you said centuries old. And, you know, one of the one of the key holdings of game B is that it's what comes after game A, which we think to be centuries old mm -hmm. and uh, has you know entrenched itself in the in these grooves of a whole lot of things that are you know producing things like the transition from family and community to state and economy and for what seemed like good reasons at the time but we end up with such an alienating way of life right and, and i think the the core idea of game b is how can we solve these existential risk problems that game a has created like powerful powerful genetic engineering with god knows what consequences climate change, nuclear weapons, how can we do that in a way that doesn't lead us to the uber dictatorship, but rather a, a return to, to stronger emphasis on the organic, on the networked, on the non-hierarchical, mm -hmm. you know, and, it, you know, like all of us, we're kind of, who look at Game B, we go, well, what is it? No one quite knows what it is yet, <laughs> but at least we know what it's not. It's not <laughs> the status quo, and we know some of the attributes of it, uh -huh. and it, it's kind of an interesting and fun thing to be exploring and necessary, it strikes me, if we're going to you know, you know, to get back a little bit more seriously, uh, game A seems to me to be driving off various cliffs all at the same time. It's a pretty serious situation. And one of the places I'm seeing this game A, game B, if you want to call it that, which, you know, I'm fine. That's fun. Let's call it that, is between generations. So you asked me at the beginning of this conversation about my relationship to the generations that came before me. And I said we could talk about that for an hour. And there's something about being alive that has something to do with the fact that maybe we're just fibers between generations. And you show up with everything you've got and you offer whatever shine you have, the gym shine, the Nora shine, whatever I have to give, whether I'm a musician or a you know, wallpaper maker or a scientist or a mom or whatever it is I have that's the thing I want, I'm bound to give, that I, I learned something from the generation that came before, and I'm giving something to the generation that comes after. And at the end of it all, that's pretty much all you got. And for me, I had to really do the work to get to that recognition. 
when I was making that film about my dad. I had to figure out where am I in this generational mess? And the, the lineages were not just linear. They were going forward and backward and circling and they were, you know, weird and curly and unfathomable and surprising. And I, they were outside of my capacity to articulate them. And now I'm recognizing a pattern of a lot of People in the sort of age range of, I don't know, they're young, but up to about 27, 28, that are really questioning, what does it mean to be a good person? How do I be a good person? How do I show up? What, what is a life goal? Like, what, how are they supposed to even think about what that is? And for you and me, we didn't grow up in a world where the future was so obscured as it is now. I don't, I don't know. Remember, remember, uh, we grew up under the shadow of the bomb, right? I grew up in a DC suburb, seven miles from the White House. And, uh, you know, we, we thought there was a 50, 50 chance we'd all be dead by the time we were teenagers. So, you know, this is, I, I, I know, but it's different because I mean, partially it's the biodiversity issue and it's just the sort of like, well, no matter what, it's not going to be like this. Gay May is done. Yep, certainly seems like it to me. Right? And so how to not placate or console people who are asking that question with dumb memes and to actually enter that, that the complexity of that question and those relationships with integrity and with the, a sort of, you know, our own complexity on board. You know, this is not that thing where you just say, oh, honey, you just follow your dreams or you can do what you need to do or, you know, don't take the world on your shoulders or you, just, you, you know, this is not that. These kids, have, they've done the math. They get it. It's over. And they, they don't know how to place themselves or how to be a good person. The structures of our systems, it, there's no way to get outside being linked to the exploitation and extraction of everything from child slaves to toxic dyes to round up monocropping. It's everywhere. Every time you touch a piece of technology or have a meal or get in a bus, it's, it's everywhere. I know it was like David Graeber's bullshit jobs. You know, he makes a pretty convincing case that a third of the people who work in Western economies are just basically doing ridiculous bullshit, right? Yeah. And what kind of life is that? You know, to spend your life taking a, a piece of paper out of the inbox, doing something weird to it, and putting it in the outbox. Of course, in this in these day and age, would be an email. It wouldn't even be a tangible piece of paper. We've developed a very weird way of life that is also on a a race to extinction. And as you say, at least a bigger number than ever before of young folks have now done the math. Sometimes they get the math wrong. I keep hearing the world will end in 12 years, which is obviously yeah. wrong, <laughs> but uh, uh, at least they've got a sense of where the vector is pointing better than a lot of other people have before. Yeah. So this is this intergenerational question. And I think that this territory is a really interesting territory for if it's systems change that's lurking somewhere in the notion of game B, that I think that that intergenerational zone is a very potent realm of possibility that has really yet to be explored in as much as it could be. And it's been interesting because I've been in circumstances recently where I've heard you know, young people talking about, hey, but this is actually really bad. And and seeing the, the boomers in the room jump up to try to make it better. All you got to do is Aikido it, or you got to do this, or you got to do that. And just watched how all those efforts to console and placate and make that young person feel better. I hate saying that word young person, by the way, that's a really yucky word. Just isolated them just left them alone in the issue. And so I would be interested in exploring that more. Because when we start to think about what's in the social and cultural connective tissue, these under articulated expectations and patterns of communication between the generations are so strong for continuance, right? So if we want discontinuance, I think we have to go there. Yeah. And, you know, on the other hand, if we look back at the, say, the 
the mild discontinuance that came out of the 60s, it basically arose almost endogenously from the baby boomers. Mm -hmm. It it certainly wasn't negotiated with the silence and the G.I. Joes. The boomers just did it with a lot of inspiration from the older silence. And I hope that the uh, millennials and Zoomers decide to do the same. Hey, there's a reason boomers are kind of rigid. We're old, goddammit. That's what happens to people when they get old. And so, you know, don't try to convince the boomers. Just fucking do it. That's the advice I'd give to the Zoomers. And by the way, there are lots of us boomers out there who are, are, are listening and trying to understand what is going on and can be allies. But it's not our job. It's your job, kids. You're the new generation. We kick the asses of the earlier generations. It's your turn to kick our ass, goddammit. Yeah. And and I think, though, that it's also in the relationship between generations, because one of the things that happened was, of course, you know, the boomers had to join the system and they did. And it didn't really make as much change as one had hoped. It did in some areas. It did in some. It did in some. Yeah. Think about, uh, you know, gay rights. What an unbelievable change has been since when I was a kid where, you know, the idea in working class, redneck America, you know, something, I mean, gay, we didn't quite know what it was until like we were in high school. And when we did sort of vaguely have an idea, it was like the worst thing imaginable uh, to now where, you know, even conservative people are pretty much at ease with it. And gay marriage is legal, all happening in like 50 years. Quite astounding. You know, it's one of the obvious fruits of the 60s. Huge progress on civil rights, you know, not solved by any means. And probably the most important one. I mean, I, this is one of my little self quotes, which I like, which I like to say when the historians from a thousand years ago look back at the 20th century, it won't be the great world wars. It won't be nuclear power. It won't be landing on the moon. It won't even be the internet. What's going to be the highlight of the 20th century is around 1975. The wave finally turned towards the true emancipation of women after 12,000 years, at least, of hardcore patriarchy in most parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And again, that change has happened unbelievably rapidly and again, driven by boomer, at least boomer accelerated, because obviously these trends go back into the 19th century, but gigantic boost of energy from boomer free thinking. And hey, now it's time for the younger generations to do something similar. It's interesting because when I was a kid, Jim, I I was at these dinner tables, you know, with all these people. And what gives me the spooks is that they were having conversations that are so much like the ones we're having right now. And I'm 51. So that was, you know, 76, 78. That was a long time ago. It's 40 years ago. And the changes that needed to get made there were, they weren't really possible to get at. And I think, so more and more, you know, I've been playing with this idea of this thing called warm data, right? And one of the sort of theoretical pieces inside the warm data idea, which is basically asking the question of what is information if you look at a complex system, a complex living system, from a transcontextual perspective, what is the information? How does the information look, smell, walk, talk, feel? How is it expressed? What do you do with it? Because, of course, these, it's not still. It's hard to define. If you pull it out of context, you can do all sorts of things. But if you don't pull things out of their contexts, they are really hard to pin down. And yet that capacity for perceiving complex living systems seems to me and interdependency seems to me to be one of the most important steps toward getting to game b is to generate as much experience as possible with as many people as possible uh, around perceiving in an interdependent way i stumbled across this concept of warm data while i was doing the research for this podcast and it intrigued me, but it's by no means clear to me what it is. Yeah. And it, it may be that it's just too early to have a crisp definition, but can you, you know, at least try to put a, some parentheses around it? Mm-hmm. I mean, basically, the definition is that it's transcontextual information about the relationships that are part of a complex system. 
And so it's just looking at how they are when they're in relationship. So it's difficult to measure things when they're changing. And if you pull them out of context, you can measure them. But when they're in multiple contexts simultaneously, it's difficult. So it becomes very difficult to identify and define and to lock down and to repeat experiments and all of those things that were the sort of the benefits of the scientific revolution. And that doesn't really work when you want to understand a, a family. You can chart the data on each person, but it doesn't really matter because it's the family is in the relationship between them. And they're dynamic, right? Yeah, they're exactly. So that would be the warm data. So I guess the, the issue is, you know, what, what kind of information are we using? What's, what's prioritized? And how do we begin to share that with each other? But as I started working with warm data, I developed this thing called a warm data lab. And in the warm data lab, you have a group of people and they explore a question that involves a complex system. So you could ask the question, for example, like, what is health in a changing world? Okay. And there's lots of contexts that are involved in that question. It could be an economic context. There's certainly technology, culture, family, politics, history, technology, art, even there's sexuality, there's all sorts of contexts, right? So the way it works is you have a group of people in a room and they are exploring this question and all those contexts are laid out like at different groupings of chairs. And then people just kind of move whenever they want to between the chairs. So they might start off talking about health in a changing world through the context of education. And then whenever they want to, they move to another place and they look at health through the context of economy in a changing world. Health, then they move to another place through the context of ecology or family or something. And each time they move, they meet new people, they're telling different stories, they're, they're talking across multiple textures of communication. So there's family stories, there's memories, there's professional knowledge, there's jokes, there's songs, there, you know, whatever it is that comes up in that particular group, which is infinitely random as far as I can figure out. And what happens is after they've changed contexts a few times, they start to have the experience of the interdependency, that you don't actually change health by adjusting any of the particular contexts. And how one then goes about contributing to the health of one's community or nation or city or whatever becomes a very different question. It's a totally different order of experience in that room where you have from about 12 to about 400 different people in the room who have experienced that interdependency asking that question. So it's pretty cool. And I'm really enjoying what's happening with it. It's getting adopted by lots of people and it's becoming a sort of a form of developing community around discovering interdependency, which is interesting and unpredictable where it will go, by the way, because I never know what's going to come out of these things. And where the, where the consequences will bubble up, I just never know. But he, what I wanted to get at was actually a, a theoretical piece of this, which is, a, I think, where I want to talk with you. So I started sort of listing all the theoretical properties of this process. And of course, it includes, you know, requisite variety. It includes autopoiesis. It includes patterns that connect, it includes difference that makes a difference, it includes schismogenesis, and all these different sort of theoretical models are inside this process. But one of them that has been really interesting to me lately is this notion of abduction, by which I do not mean um, stealing children. I, I, <laughs> I mean... The Persian meaning, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, and how the Persian meaning got kind of literally abducted by my dad. And so it's this idea that we're, you know, we're using one context to make sense of another. So where we're getting so stuck is when the sense making around a particular experience is formed across and through and within multiple contextual experiences. 
of language, of education, of, you know, money, of science, of culture, of all kinds of things that are reconfirming and affirming and materializing various sense-making forms. So we, you know, we're, we're learning to make sense of the health system through the education system. We're learning to make sense of the education system and the health system through the economic system. So they're deeply steeped together and, and kind of imprinted in a kind of, if you thought of it as a bunch of sponges with paint, like all the paint would be mixed together because you can't actually pull it apart anymore. So I'm finding this notion of abduction to be really an interesting piece and to get down into that place where the abductive process of sense-making across different contexts is where the matrix has got us and how we begin to sense-make across multiple contexts simultaneously in this moment. That seems to me to be really important. Interesting you uh, raise this. We just had a major conference at the Santa Fe Institute on the new economics, what comes after status quo economics. And it's a narrower field than you're talking about, but we had some very similar issues and concerns, which is, you know, formal university PhD economics is basically applied math, right? And the reality is an economic system has got way more dimensionality than you can possibly explore in plain old math, at least other than in toy problems. And so the, the question the group was pushing on was, what tools do we have to look at high dimensional interactions, mm -hmm. right? That are frankly beyond our intellectual ability to process. I mean, I can't, think about what's going to happen when there's nine different dimensions of interaction, all of which are important. And, you know, all this may sound very prosaic. I think the lead idea that came out of this meeting was to kind of reinvigorate an older idea, which was uh, simulation through agent-based modeling, mm. where we actually, we can create software agents that say exemplify all nine forces that are acting on this individual from lust to... Ah status seeking, to hunger, to needing shelter, to uh, competitive lust, you know, wanting to compete and win and, you know, to find some rules that seem plausible enough to throw a bunch of them, you know, literally millions in some cases into a agent-based modeling framework and let them interact and see what emerges. Because I think the, you know, the thing that's really, really hard about these high dimensional problems is that the results likely to be an emergence yeah, by definition, emergence is something you cannot see in advance until it happens. Exactly. And if you go into it with a goal in mind, you've already truncated your complexity. Exactly. And I don't think humans are smart enough to do abduction in high dimensional space by using their brains. They have to find tools to get there. And kind of, I like this warm data approach. Of a, have you reduced that to practice? Do you have a handbook for people that want to do warm data? Well, I've been doing these, these warm data labs all over the world. And I, it would be so fun to come and do them at Santa Fe. I think you guys would love it. Yeah, we'll have to, we should talk about that. And then maybe we, we could also engage somebody to help you reduce it to practice so that others can use it. Uh, you know, one of the uh, not too much talked about at the moment, but in the original Game B world, we had a concept called X in a box where X could be anything. And the idea was to find tools that many people would have use for and reduce them to a customizable formula, say a handbook for doing a warm data lab. You use it for any kind of high dimensional abductive process and you know get that out into a form that's a live document where not only can you as the inventor of it continue to improve your handbook, but you can interact with people that are using it in the field and you can learn from their experiences as the community together tries to improve this tool. Well, I, I have started a training course because I actually felt like the hosts needed to be able to see it working. They needed to be able to see the patterns. It doesn't matter if the participants have it. I mean, I, I, I actually... Kids use warm data. Politicians are using warm data. It's going into communities in vulnerable cities. It's in Asia. It's in Australia. It's in Pittsburgh. It's popping up everywhere. It's really exciting. And I have 
trained more than 200 hosts now. And it, but it's a it's a course. It's a hardcore, you know, I like rigor. <laughs> I like to go down into the territory beyond where we have conscious verbal intellectual control, but I like rigor before I go there. So I, it's about a five day course and it's a great course because you can start to see all of these processes alive in the lab because otherwise people make, they make weird sort of errors of logical type. They don't really understand about how the abduction is working. They don't, so the hosts kind of need to know what's going down, but the, the participants don't have to know anything to take part in it. They can just take part at any level. In fact, probably be better if they don't know how, how the uh, apparatus works, right? Because you'll bias their behaviors. I mean, I always do it. One of the sort of instructions is that as the host, you always join. It's not a facilitation. It's a hosted thing. So I always join the labs and meet everybody and go in. And it's um, I always learn something every time I learn so much. This was the big piece for me, Jim, was that... What I learned doing these labs is this, that complexity is something much more intimate than I thought. And it's interesting because I actually am one of the few people in the world who grew up with it in my breakfast cereal, right? So if that's why I wrote Small Arcs the way I wrote it, was I figured everybody else out there can write a book about systems and complexity. But what I have been blessed with, if you will, is that for me, these theories were a way of life. And I was always taught to perceive the complexity in life, in daily living, in the interaction with anyone and anything that I was around. And so it was interesting that even for me, this was a surprise. But what I learned was that I had been teaching courses on complexity and systems thinking for, you know, a long time, a decade or something. And I never got the results ever that I got when I did an hour long warm data lab. People came out the other side and they got it. They understood interdependency because it was attached to their own memories. It wasn't a map on the wall or a structure or new jargon. It was something that was abducting their memories across multiple contexts and reconnecting the way they were seeing the world at a fundamental level. And it had nothing to do with abstraction. It was absolutely inside the experience of being human through another window, if you will. I love that. Yeah. I love that. It's, you know, it actually gets around the problem of the agent based model, which it has to be abstract. This is potentially doing something similar, which is high dimensional abduction without the abstraction. Yeah, it wasn't abstract at all. And I just had a, a 13 year old kid who I went through the training process. She did a, um, a lab with her class in Australia. And she said the kids just loved it. They wanted to do it all day long. And they did a, a warm data lab on the question of what is food in a changing world. And they had about 11 contexts and they just went to every single one. And they were talking about food and economy and talking about food and history and connecting it to their families and their own preferences and their experiences. And they're it, incredible. If little kids can do it and people in inner cities are doing it, even politicians can do it. <laughs> even politicians, the lowest of low, right? Yeah. Uh, interesting. So, so for our audience, I mean, we have some very interesting people who listen to the show. Yeah. A lot of them are involved in the in the world changing movement. Suppose someone wants to learn how to do warm data. How do they get a hold of you for that purpose? Yeah, they probably need to just send me an email. Um, go through the, the Bateson Institute or find me in social media because I'm everywhere in there. And I offer courses. I think I've, I've got one coming up in Ireland in February and might have one in Pittsburgh in January, one in Brazil in January as well. We'll put a link up to wherever you tell us to put it to for people who are interested in 
connecting with you to get some training in how to do this warm data thing, because it sounds really interesting. And if you could actually get instantiated in the individuals, a high dimensional but non-abstracted perspective on the problem, that would be huge. It's huge, Jim. It's so amazing. And every time it blows my mind. I can see why. It's, uh, it's, it's what we kind of wanted, but we haven't been able to figure out how to do otherwise. It's kind of interesting that we're doing it in the humans themselves, which probably we should have thought about that. Duh. <laughs> you want a non-abstracted version, probably shouldn't do it in a computer. You should probably do it in a human, right? Well, that's exactly how I felt was sort of like, well, duh. But I mean, really, I had every opportunity to have already known this. And I, I was still just sort of gobsmacked when I saw it happen and watched the level of it has to do with the fact that people speak in multiple tones across multiple contexts with multiple people if you think of it as a moire think of all the patterns that are overlaying and and there's no documentation during the lab because if you document then the the cooking stops you know that you need to be able to let those things swirl around and connect and relink and reframe and they need to keep moving until after the lab. And then there's a sense-making moment that's in the plenary that, that I call the somathesy moment. So that's this word for mutual learning. But that's the mutual learning moment where it's actually at the group level, the words form around what has just been experienced and not before, which has been a really interesting kind of development of watching how this works because some people at the end of this hour and a half they they don't have any words at all for what they've just experienced they're just sort of sitting in the the, the soup and other people they start to find them slowly and then one person will say yeah i i noticed that the same stories were coming up in different contexts. Or I noticed when I sat down that I had no idea what these people were talking about, that they had approached it completely differently than I would have. Or, you know, they, they, they start to find the edges where they can begin to understand what has happened. And then together they, they work it out. So the, in the plenary, there's this kind of mutual learning of how are we going to put language on this experience we just shared? So they all had completely different conversations, right? If you were to get a transcript of it, they didn't have the same conversation. They were in different things. What they did was they had a trajectory through conversation space, every trajectory different. Exactly. So the pings of recognition and familiarity are absolutely not the same in each person. But the overall thing is the same, which is the recognition of, well, where's the health? How are you going to contribute to health? Are you going to get a new exercise plan? Are you going to, you know, put new iPods in schools? Are you going to get a Fitbit? Like, which, where is it? And of course, it's in the liminal space. It's in the interdependency. And that's the piece where there's, you know, sometimes suddenly this moment of this kind of gasp of hopelessness of like, oh, no, we don't know what to do in that space because that isn't a space. That's the space of no space. <laughs> what do we do now? We have to make something up. Yeah. And it's up to us. You know, it's, it's in, to my mind, that's the, the learned helplessness of people in, in game A is the first thing we have to crack. People don't realize, frankly, the world is like butter. You can cut the world, make it do what you want if you put enough force against it, right? So many people have just become helpless and expect the world like you know, kind of like your conversation about the state in sweden mm -hmm. let somebody else deal with my problems no we need to deal with our problems god damn it yeah and and we need to do it by getting out of our roles so that's one of the things that pops out right away is that you know someone will be an expert in something right Every, everyone's an expert in something and so they know their script when they're sitting in that context and they kind of, you know, they, they got it down. But when they get to a, the next context, they don't have a script for that one. So they have to source their understanding of that, you know, whether whatever it is, health in the form of economy. And they're not an economist and they're not a doctor, but they do have a body and they do have a bank account, right? So they have to drop in to their humanity. They have to drop into this lived experience. 
and connect it to their professional space or connect it across lots of different aspects. And it's, it's the thing of really recognizing that if we're working with complex issues, we've got to be working with indirect response. And this is a sort of a paradoxical question of how do you prepare an indirect response? Because the second you try to solve a complex problem by directly going at it, you've already missed the bus. So how do you begin to generate an indirect response? And that, that has been so exciting to see what people come up with. And the directions they take it and these things that just come out, like you said, it generates a kind of, you know, second order cybernetics emergent um, thing is happening. Yeah, it's very, very cool. I think, you know, again, I'm going to call out to people in the Game B world and the rest of the social change world. Somebody ought to take the door up on it and get you get trained on her technique. Give it a try and see see what happens. I'd love to see, uh, you know, careful uh, documentation of how the process works, not necessarily documentation within the process, but an outer documentation to really think about this thing is possibly a very powerful phenomenon. It's a very powerful phenomenon, and I'm a little scared to write it up. Ah, that's, that's good. That means you got something. You know, I've been sitting on this pressure to write this warm data book, which I'm half done, but I keep not doing it. And this is the reason I'm not doing it is because I, 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 you know, this is, this is, I don't, it would be something that I think I might need to do with other people to try to keep it from getting too, I don't know. I mean, you know, we've seen what happens with a world that metabolizes all good ideas into ways of making money and getting control. And the last thing I want to be a part of is finding a way for people to get control of complexity or emergence. It's always what comes up. It's like, okay, so we have complexity. Great. Let's manage it. Uh The worst case scenario now becomes a power tool for ad agencies, right? Or something. I mean, it, it might be beyond that, but it's the logical types aspect of it that kind of give me the heebie-jeebies. Can you say a little bit more about that? Well, you know, with Bertrand Russell's logical types, when you're picking the topic and the contexts in a warm data lab, you have to understand logical typing. And, you know, that's math. <laughs> But it's also not math. It's, it's you know, it's some sort of combination of Bertrand Russell and my dad coming together to think about what it means to not make logical typing errors. And, and even when you're doing abductive inquiry, you have to be careful what level your contexts are on. Because if you get them at the wrong ones, you can make associations that are all sorts of trouble. And that's not good. So I, there are things that I don't know yet about this. That's why you haven't written your book. I've had the same problem when I was supposed to write a, you know, important essay about topic A. If I'm still learning about it at a rapid rate, it's a sign to me it's not time to write the essay. I know, but the world is so demanding right now of this work getting out there because there's urgency. And also there's just so much, so much human effort and money and just an exhaustion of people's focus on all these things that are actually completely going nowhere. And it's so frustrating to watch it. And you just think, oh, I wish I could just give you something that you could play with, but it's not quite cooked yet. (laughs) I I feel your frustrations. I got a couple of things like that I'm cooking myself, uh, not in this area, but in other areas. This this has been an amazing conversation and this uh, sets the new world record for the least number of my topics I've gotten to in a conversation. I usually get to about two thirds of my uh, topic notes. I would say we got to 20% today, but we explored some amazing new space. But I would, if you don't mind, like to ask you one a little bit more bounded question that I think is closely related to all the things we've just been talked about. In the book, you talk about leadership within the paradox of agency. Mm. And one of the issues, problems, and opportunities, certainly in Game B, and I think in all people, world changers, thinking about what comes next, is what does leadership mean in a world that's probably not hierarchical, more network-oriented, you know, aiming for meta-stability, not rigid stability? What's your vision of leadership going forward? 
Oh, Jim, I, I, you know, it's a cringe word for me, but it is an important thing to talk about. And I, I think that for me, what, what I see is that that leadership has something to do more with improvisation in the sense that you can, you know, jump in and jump out, give what you got to give and get back and let somebody else give what they have to give. So there's that. Then there's also, I, it, it's connected to a form of integrity that I'm exploring right now, which is a different kind of integrity. It's not the integrity of you know, the, the rules of right and wrong. It's the integrity of living in a world in which we don't know. We're unfamiliar with the complexities that we're faced with. And in that complexity, being in it with humility and curiosity and rigor in a way that recognizes this delicate interdependency of life. And, and so many of the humans that have stepped into leadership roles have abused it. And so many of the people who have actually been working with systems and complexity, you know, they're, they're super smart in their books and then they treat their kids like shit or they, you know, that, that there's not an extension of that care into the details of everyday life, which is actually really a rigorous thing to do. To take that intellectual knowing and theoretical knowing and lodge it firmly in the process of getting from one day to the next. Yeah, I think that's a key, a key theme in the Game B work, particularly people like Jordan Hall. I don't know if you've read any of his stuff, but he's very much about how do we take these grand theories from complexity and other places and turn them into a way of being that's authentic and yet rigorous. Yeah. I'm with him on this. I haven't heard him say those words, but if he said them, I agree with him. I doubt he said them quite that way, but you know, he'll, <laughs> he, he, he'd use a lot more words, I'll tell you that. I love Jordan. He's great. He's, he's one of my best friends, but yeah. he can, can be a little bit verbose sometimes, but I'll, I'll say three words, he'll say 37, but I'm sure he gets it gets nuances that I missed. I'm kind of a you know straightforward person of action, not necessarily a uh, you know a subtle thinker in the way he is, but yeah, I think we're all working towards these same things in our own way. I'm going to throw something back at you, a little bit about leadership, one of the we've talked about in the Game B world and other places, is the distinction between position-based leadership and role-based leadership. Mm. You know, if we think of position-based leadership as, you know, your typical, I'm the manager of the XYZ department because my name is in the box and my name is on the door. Well, role-based leadership is, hey, a group of people are trying to solve a problem and for the next half hour, I'm going to lead the discussion because I know more about how to fix an automatic transmission than anybody else in the group. But when the topic moves on to how to fix the engine, that's somebody else's job to lead that discussion. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. You step in and you step out. So no one's the leader. It's just a space for whoever's going to take the solo. A jazz solo. I love that. Okay, that's it. Leader, leadership as jazz solo, right? <laughs> exactly. Right, watch the guy come on with the hot, or the gal come on with the hot saxophone. <laughs> yeah. And then step back. And then step back. Let the drummer have his solo, right? Yeah. I think I'm going to end on that note. Nora's vision of leadership as a jazz solo within the context of all the instruments having their own solos. Yeah, we're in this together. Yeah. So you, even when you're doing a solo, it has to be in relationship to the other players and the audience and the music. And the history. And the music that came before. I mean, that's the cool thing about jazz. It's improvisational, but it's not free, totally free. When you're doing your solo, it has to be in the context of everything that came before. And it's that thing. It's the it's that place where the experiences and the you know the brokennesses and the beauty of you shine through. But also it's totally contextual and transcontextual that you're responding in that environmental interdependency. That's the final word right there. I don't think you need to say any more. Perfect. All right. Thanks a lot. This is, as I said, this has went in lots of directions I didn't anticipate, but that's a good thing, right? I thought every single word that you said was interesting, and I hope our audience will find the same. And as I mentioned a couple of times, there'll be pointers, links on the episode page to resources of various sorts, ways to get a hold of Nora, et cetera. So thank you very much. And, you know, I look forward to seeing this, particularly about this warm data thing. I mean, 
I wasn't quite sure what it was when I read it in the book, but now based after this conversation, I'm going to really follow your work in this field. I think this could be tremendously transformational. I think so too. And Jim, it's been such a pleasure. Production services and audio editing by Jared Janes Consulting. Music by Tom Muller at modernspacemusic.com.